There we go. All right. Well, it is the first Wednesday of the month. Welcome to another episode of Talking Trout. Uh, I'm Mike Coor. I'm the former state council chair for Wisconsin Trout Unlimited. I currently serve as our advocacy chair. Um, we've got a, a couple of great guests on, on tonight. We've got Duke Welter and uh, Gary Horbath, who I'm sure if, if folks have been around TU for a while, you've probably run into to these two fellows. They've done a, a fair amount of work for our organization. Um, and they're going to be uh, talking about a project on the, the Kinney River that I think is uh, um, it is not really just a local project. It's it's much more of a regional and uh, and and statewide um, importance when we when we look at you know trout streams and the opportunity that that we're presented with here. So um, with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Duke um, to to go ahead with the presentation. And, and Duke, I don't know if you want to just start out and maybe just give a brief introduction of uh, of yourself for folks that that may not know who you are. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. It, you know, looking at the at the pictures and the the names on here, it's really a treat to see so many of you that are uh, that are friends and and uh, and and that I've run into through TU stuff. Um, Gary, I need to I need to say is one of those people with TU that uh, that does uh, every job that a chapter needs, including. Uh, at chapter president at least twice, maybe three times, Gary, you can just hold fingers up twice. Okay. And, and we were, uh, back in the nineties, we were, I was state council chair and Gary was our vice chair for, uh, for a period of time. Uh, and, but he's done everything that Kayapta wish could, uh, could ask for from a volunteer. And I don't know how long his sentence has been as a board member. But I gotta feel it's got it's more than twenty five years. Yep. Is that is that true, Gary? Yeah, I I, I hung on to uh, see this dam out. So, <laughs> well, so once once it's out, I'll step down. <laughs> and this is not Gary's first rodeo, because he was a a leader in the discussion back around the turn of the century to remove the Bounds Dam on the Willow River, and and that was a hugely controversial thing. But that chapter was steadfast, and they stuck with it, and they got it out, and it's a beautiful Dells area. And so, so Gary's Gary's got uh, incredible chops as a as a as a dam guy. So, uh, and and you know. Other than that, I've been involved in in dam wrestles since I was a oh, maybe a chapter president in Eau Claire in the mid '90s, and that that involved several dams in our area uh, and and in other parts of the state that the council got involved in or our chapter got involved in. Uh, we were successful on on several the Merrill uh, uh, Ward Paper Mill Dam and the uh, the Deerskin Dam up in Vilas County and the uh, uh, and the the Colfax 18 Mile Creek Dam, we got our heads handed to us on the the Bloomer uh, Duncan Creek Dam. We forced a referendum and then we lost the referendum campaign. And there was a lot of uh, a lot of scurvy actions taking place in in uh, in uh, Bloomer to make sure that the the story didn't get out and it didn't. Uh, we didn't do a good enough job. Uh, all I can do in Bloomer is pray for rain. Uh, so anyway, anyway, to uh, to move on. Oh, the other thing that I that I was involved in a little bit was uh, while I was on the TU Board of Trustees, the National Board, from 2002 or so to 2010. Uh, TU was a, a leader on some national, real path breaking, groundbreaking, pathfinding projects to remove dams. He, the Edwardsville Dam on the Connecticut River was probably the first, and scientists were blown away by the uh, the number of sea run species, shad and herring and others, as well as uh, the species of salmonids that, that we were interested in helping restore. And then it went on to the Penobscot, which was a couple hundred million dollar project to take out two dams and provide fish passage around two that would be modified enough that uh, that that fish would be able to get up in into those river that river and it opened up 1500 miles of spawning habitat for those ocean run species 
And now there are millions of ocean run fish that are going up those that river. And then TU was also involved heavily in the Elwha dams in the Olympic Peninsula, which turned out to be a uh, oh, $150 million project with two dams, 100 feet and 200 feet high that had completely stopped the, the salmon run. But the tribes and TU and other groups were steadfast in trying to get them out. And they've finally come out. And this coming year, they're going to take out uh, start taking out the four dams on the Klamath, which starts in uh, North South Oregon and goes into Northern California. Uh, and, and that'll be a, a, a big project as well. Uh, the, the one that's tantalizing that's hanging out there is uh, the four dams on the Lower Snake River. Uh, and I, I admire their uh, stick-to-itiveness because at my first national meeting in 1998, TU passed a resolution calling for the the removal of the four dams on the lower snake and now we're 24 years down the road and they are making progress but um i i'm i'm really interested in this project because it's it's here where we are and it's a marvelous river uh and it has a chance to make a a long-term uh contribution toward its sustainability so we'll jump into the powerpoint and i just have to tell you there's some really important news in the it just in the last uh week 10 days and and even today we got a really big piece of news about the the kinney dams that i'll share with you a little later so i'm going to share my screen now and uh don't hesitate to raise a question in the chat and uh, we'll try to get to them as we go otherwise we'll we'll have a, a discussion at the end and and answer them all so thanks for thanks for being on board tonight thank you so here we go There we go. So, so one of the things about this river is that it is such a remarkable, iconic river. It's a river that leads people to write about it, leads people like like Bob White to to paint it. And this is a, a, a picture in the lower uh, part of the river, the Kinney Canyon, at dawn. Uh, I'll give you a hint who the uh, the uh, the angler is. Generally, well, they actually that rock he's standing next to started out uh, in the painting as a golden retriever, uh, but but that's uh, that's a pretty good representation of the the lower Kinney at dawn or at dusk. So here we go. Uh, of course, you know you know Gary and me. Uh, Gary's been, as I said, has been so active in dam discussions for Kayaptowish for. For so many years that it's no surprise that he has a license plate that he does. Uh, I just put mine in here because uh, you may be wondering who has such a weird license plate. And uh, of course, that's my favorite uh, river uh, vegetation. But I also waited for you know uh, a blonde in a in a in a in a convertible to pull up alongside me on the freeway and go hello to you too. Never happened. So anyway, we'll talk a little bit tonight about the just just the, the the reputation of this river and why it why it is so iconic and why it's important. Uh, I think to anglers across the Midwest who appreciate it. We'll talk about the dam project and we'll talk about some developments. I I yeah, I thought you know some of you might want fish pictures, some of you might want duck pictures. So I got I tried to cover all the bases. Uh, now. Now, what we would all like to see, obviously, is something really explosive, some kind of demolition and removal of these uh, this this dam, uh, like the Marmot Dam on the Sandy River in Oregon. Uh, I visited that in twenty you know, two thousand one uh, when they were considering the dam discussion. It was really interesting because people that were that really should have been thinking about the the, the total ecology of the river. Uh, we're concerned about the the impact on hatchery uh, salmon that were in the river below the dam. Finally got that out, and I, I'm cheering for them. Uh, so the Kinney, Kinney, what a storied river. We have all kinds of books about it. Uh, we have uh, it's it's mentioned in high regard by by many writers that you know. Um, I'll I'll talk about a few of them in this in a minute. Uh, it's a river that that's known for uh, reliable aquatic insect hatches from its own ephemerella in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, it's either, depending on who you talk to, 
uh, the fly shop guy, it's uh, ephemerella need hammy, or the if you're talking to the the entomologist emeritus from UW River Falls, it's ephemerella excrutions. But either way, you're fishing with a an olive bodied ginger hackled fly uh, that is known as a kinney sulfur, also on the rush. Caddis, crane flies, Hendrickson's, they're all all well present. Um, some of our favorite authors have really had a lot to say about, about the Kinney. There's no question that Jim Humphreys, uh, who wrote the co-wrote Wisconsin, Minnesota trout streams, uh, would have would have uh would have fished the Kinney on the last day of his angling life. Uh, and Steve Bourne and the gang of four that did the trout streams, the Wisconsin trout streams, the angler's guide pointed out that it's the only outstanding resource water uh, and a cold water stream throwing, flowing through a city of 10,000 people in this state. So, you know, there's a lot of things to commend it. But, you know, you can you can take a look at the river and you can kind of break it up into, into, oh, yeah, here's another one. This is a kid's book from 1962, 60 years ago. There's a delightful, charming story uh, by Edie Records who... Uh, wrote about her dad, Pudge Records, teaching her kids how to fish the kinney. And there's a lot of ecology in there. It's kind of like watching the way of a trout through a 10-year-old's eyes. Uh, so anyway, back to the, the river itself. It's really, really two rivers. The, uh, it starts in tremendous, tremendously pr productive springs north of Highway 90, I-94, uh, up near Roberts and Hammond, uh, and it uh, it comes out of those springs clear and cold and well calcified, and it it had for 20 miles, it's a it's a sort of languorous spring creek. It's got plenty and plenty of uh, miles of restoration, parking access, uh, and public fishing easements, and it has about 7,000 brooks and browns per mile. Uh, there are tributaries like Parker and Kelly that that are good spawning trips, uh, but they're also good brook trout water. And, uh, you know, the TU chapter and the DNR and other groups in the area have worked really hard on the upper river. Uh, the lower river is known as the canyon. And you do the 20 miles upstream, uh, and then you get to River Falls, and there's about two miles that's not trout water at all. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But after you get below the lower dam in the city of River Falls, uh, you start into the canyon. And then it's about seven miles down to the confluence with the St. Croix. Uh, there are bluffs that are 350, 400 feet high, limestone that has spring spring flows through it that, that weeps down the, the, the limestone bluffs. Uh, and it's known as a crying limestone. It has about 3,000 fish per mile. I would say about 2,995 of them. Uh, are brown trout. Uh, they're bigger than the browns in the upper river. There are a few little tribs. And the South Fork of the Kinney, which is a, a brook trout stream that drops in between the two dams. And uh, and browns can't get up it because it's quite a cataract, uh, but it can contribute brook trout to the lower river uh, if it wasn't feeding into an impoundment. Uh, so the, the South Fork has the opportunity to bring cold water and brook trout, and it and and uh, up until just very recently it hasn't. Um, the public access to the lower river, uh, the the absolute last mile and a quarter or so is part of the Kinnikinnick River State Park. Upstream from that, the Kinnikinnick Land Trust has worked for twenty five, a little over twenty five years now. Uh, to conserve the river, to get conservation easements in place, and and to uh, add public access when it comes, uh, when it's available, and uh, and they've done a pretty good job of that, so that you can uh, you can get public access to about half of the lower river. Uh, more than that, it's become a paddler's river, and uh, and and upper river here is uh, riffle pool habitat. The lower river is a little more. Uh, I'm sorry, the upper river is more spring like spring creek like habitat. The lower river is more riffle pool habitat, like this. This is the day that we hauled our canoe down to the just below the lower dam and, and paddled down to the state park 
Um, uh, but this beautiful river, well-regarded river, is one that's at risk. And the probably the best the best uh, bit of science that uh, well, let's we'll we'll talk about the risks that are posed by uh, the dams that are on the river. Um, the the two dams are the uh, the upper one, the Junction Falls Dam and the lower one, the Powell Falls Dam. Uh, Junction Falls forms Lake Louise, I'm sorry, Lake George, and it's right behind Main Street on, uh, on River Falls. And, uh, and, it, and the, the lower impoundment, both of them are about 15 acres. Uh, the, the, the lower impoundment is uh, edged by Glen Park and a really steep walk down to the base of the uh, Paul Falls Dam. Uh, the 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 Kayaptuish chapter started thermal monitoring on the river above, between, and below the dams back in 1991. And the, there are a couple of interesting upshots of that uh, monitoring, which is really professionally done by Kent Johnson, who some of you may know, and who spent his career as a water monitor with the Metropolitan Council in the Twin Cities. But the upshot, the key upshot in this case was that the lower river is four to five degrees warmer in the summer than the upper river. Uh, and so the summertime high temperatures are four to five degrees warmer. Uh, that and the days that temperatures are uncomfortable for even the brown trout, the more tolerant brown trout are increasing as we go forward. That means that leads the climate scientists to tell us that this river is at risk, uh, the lower river is at risk uh, as, a, as a cold water system. Now, so that thermal information is one of the key points that we have as uh, uh, support for the dam removals. Another thing that we have is, is this visual image and it's the upper falls, the junction falls before the dam from 1865. Uh, you'll see in a few minutes where the dam obscures the falls and has since at least the 1890s. Uh, but uh, this is a kind of vision that most communities that are contemplating dam removal don't have. They are uh, faced with a, a history as long as anybody remembers in their community of having dams there because they needed dams when they started for grist mills and lumber mills and shingle mills and all kinds of stuff. And even if those dams are, the purpose of those dams is long gone, they can't envision their community without them. And, and that's what's great about River Falls, that they have this, uh, this vision that they can uh, revive as opposed to not having any vision at all. So the, the upper dam, this is the one that obscures the falls you saw in the previous slide. Uh, that was built around 1920, but had been had had other dams there since the 1800s. Its 15-acre impoundment is filled up to 90 percent, uh, and it generates a tiny bit of the city's municipal utility needs, about $50,000 a year net. And it's licensed by the federal government. It's the and uh, and that'll come into play as we start talking about the dam removal process. Um, so there's that key science, and keep it in mind because it's really crucial to what has gone on. This is a, a, a drone view of the, uh, uh, on the left, the powerhouse for the Junction Falls Dam. Uh, just, uh, just across on the far bank is the input of the, or the inflow from the south fork of the Kickapoo, that cold water system. Just out of that picture is a uh, falls that's probably 15 feet high. So brown trout are not going to be able to get up the, uh, the the south fork from the lower river unless they're brought in a bucket. Uh, and then down on the lower right, you'll see one of two spring ponds that contribute cold water. Now, for years and years, they've contributed, they both contributed cold water, but it immediately sits in the lower impoundment and it warms up. This is the lower the lower dam, the Powell Falls Dam. Um, it generates a half a percent of what the city needs or about $25,000 uh, worth a year. The city buys all the rest of its electricity on the market 
and uh, at about the same prices. But if they have to do any repairs or anything like that, the prices just went up on the dam generated electricity. It too has been filled up with sediment. Well, uh, you'll you'll see a little bit, bit more about the the drawdown, but this is a lower impoundment, and this is uh, our, in the summer of 2020. Uh, those uh, uh, you can see what kind of uh, algae there is, and there's really no fishery in either of the impoundments. Uh, there are a lot of geese. There's a lot of goose poop. Uh, there's really they're really dead water, and when you, so when you look at when you look at these impoundments, uh, what you're going to see is that we have the opportunity to restore them, uh, replace them with a free-flowing river that's right behind Main Street. And I'm looking kind of forward to this community uh, refocusing its vision on the river instead of looking out at Main Street. So back in uh, Jan in December of 2013, uh, the city moved to relicense these dams with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for 30 years. They thought there would be no discussion about it, no controversy or anything. And um, and what do you know? The first community meeting brought 200 people, including our friend Gary Horbath, who's kind of hunkered over in the in the front row at the at the left. Uh, Gary and other people, Kai Aptowish and other people in the community went to dozens and dozens of meetings, hundreds and hundreds of people. And eventually they came up with a plan for the Kinney Corridor and asked the city council to uh, approve removing the dams. And uh, the, the city did, but they added some, uh, some uh, requirements. One was that there would be no city tax revenues used uh, to uh, pay for dam removal. Uh, two, was they were going to uh, de-license the lower dam first by 2026 and remove the dam by then, and then re-license the upper dam uh, until 2046, uh, unless we could find the money somewhere to take to take it out. So 2026 seemed like a sort of a long, long uh, horizon. Uh, well, the city also asked for a new non nonprofit to help raise the funding and educate people. And in 2019, the Kinney Corridor Collaborative was organized as a 501c3 to assist the city. I was asked to be uh, the, the fundraising chair for the Kinney CC. Uh, and I've worked on that as a DARE employee up until my retirement from DARE a month ago. Uh, well, it's the end of March. Uh, and, uh, and I'll continue to work on it as a volunteer. So, so when I started trying to do the fundraising, I'd call up a foundation that likes dam removals and I'd say, hey, you want to support a dam removal? They'd say, oh, we love dam removals. When's it coming out? And I'd say 2026. And they'd say, great, call us in 2025. It was tough. Well, you know, like I, like I said, sometimes some places I just pray for rain. And in uh, uh, June of 2020, uh, the Kinney had oh, I don't know, eight or 10 inches of rain in 12 hours or something. And the Kinney ran high six or eight feet over the top of both dams. Uh, well, our prayers have been answered. Uh, it drew, it damaged the Powell Falls Dam over where the, uh, where the, uh, uh, the dam concrete meets the sandstone bluff. Uh, and it, and eventually the city uh, decided not to repair the dam and asked for uh, authority from from the federal agency to draw it down, which was done in October of 20. Uh, and, and then kind of with a little urging from us in the nonprofit, they asked the feds to okay to approve surrendering the license, which was approved in February of 2022. Now, uh, you, you know, that, so you'll see a, a few more figures that have to do with the dam drawdown. But uh, in this area, just upstream from the dam, the banks for quite a ways are 10 to 13 feet high. The, the estimates were that 20 or 15,000 yards of sediment flushed downstream in the flood and another 8,000 flushed downstream in the drawdown. Well, Kayaptowish was right on top of this, as usual, monitoring sediment 
uh, I'm sorry, moder moder monitoring the thermal impacts. And once that dam was drawn down in the summer of 21, the temperature of the lower river was uh, three degrees cooler than it had been for the last 30 years. Now that one data point doesn't give you uh, give you uh, uh, proof that it's going to happen for good, uh, but the, that that data point was certainly promising, and that means that that water from the South Fork and that water from the springs is not being warmed in the impoundment anymore, and so they're uh, you know that's sending that water downstream and it's benefiting the fishery downstream already. Just think what would happen if we get them both out. So fast forward to uh, May 9th, you know, we had a moderate rain rainfall of three quarters of an inch of rain and then an inch and a half two days later. Uh, but there was a lot more rain in the upstream, upriver end of the watershed. And that sent a lot of water downstream. And even though that whole impoundment had greened up wonderfully, uh, the um, uh, the impoundment refilled briefly and then was back uh back to uh its pre rainstorm level uh but you know the upshot is that impoundment soil is getting a chance to dry out and it's going to make it easier to work so so uh tu had a key role in this uh this dam funding uh opportunities and uh, when the dam was licensed by FERC, the only place we could get uh, DNR support would be a $50,000 small dam removal grant. The, the DNR's main grant was the municipal dam grant, uh, and that would have been a, a 400000 one. Uh, but um, that wasn't any, any dam that was licensed by the feds wasn't eligible. So asking the city to surrender the license opened the way for the city to be open for this uh, DNR grant. And then TU had gotten together in the beginning of the last legislative session that's just ending. Uh, and, and the governor had asked that the municipal dam grant program be expanded from 2 million a year to 5 million a year, and the cap be raised from 400,000 to a million per project. Well, that would have been even better than 400. So TU uh, raised $5,000 from our chapters and state council and a little bit from national. And we hired TU's, Wisconsin TU's lobbyist who speaks fluent Republican uh, to uh, help us lobby for that. Now the, up, the, the gist of what we were advised was, this is a long, long, long shot. Uh, you got a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature, and and there's a lot of reasons that this isn't going to happen. But we were a little naive, and so we worked with the city, and we worked with legislators, and we worked with the Wisconsin TU, Mike Coor and Henry Colts in the Capitol, and the lobbyists. And darned if the doggone thing didn't didn't uh, uh, didn't pass. Uh, and then uh, uh, the city was eligible to apply for this million dollar grant. Um, on the 16th of May, the DNR told the city, you're on the priority list. The utilities manager told us in a planning session, we'll have that dam out and sediment management done by a year from today. So the engineers are back at work. And I can tell you the big news is that we heard today is that the DNR met with the city utilities manager and he walked in the door and they said, congratulations, you're a millionaire. We got the full $1 million grant, and that's going to be able to be used for dam demolition, debris removal, and the management of this sediment that you can see in this picture. Um, so, so we're on track with uh, to, to raise the funding. The city utilities have committed to $1.2 million. With the, um, the DNR grant, We've got 2.2 million. I'll talk a little bit more about that, and I'll talk a little bit in a minute about the uh, the later the second dam, which, if it turns out the way we're hoping, and we've been lucky so far, uh, we might not have to do a general fundraising push, but the Corps of Engineers, the city, and the DNR might be able to do it 
uh, without uh, without us uh, stepping up. So this might be our great opportunity to step up for the river, set an example, and have the city move it forward with the second dam removal. And it would happen a lot sooner than 2046. So, so what do they have to do to get this thing out? Now, this is this is a different dam removal, but it's not going to be dissimilar to what has to be done on the Kinney. Uh, but they need to build a causeway down around the edge of the former impoundment to the dam site and then demolish it. They don't get to blow it up, but they'll use a an excavator with a tooth on it to demolish it and then get the debris out and slope the sediment to establish the floodplain. And then parkland, fish habitat, and, and some changes to the stormwater system. And we got a brand new park and uh, expanded fishery and expanded angler access and uh, a really nice facility for the city to look at and say, hey, can we do that with a second one? And, and say yes. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of these damn situations and, and we went around and talked to people in different places. Baraboo was a good example and Merrill was another. This is the Colfax Dam removal in, uh, on 18 Mile Creek, just before it flows into the Red Cedar River. And you can see the amount of sediment. That was like a 17 foot dam with 15 foot of sediment. And uh, the, the village uh, agreed to take it out and the DNR came in and did a lot of settlement work and TU, uh, the, the Clearwaters chapter, then the Ojibwe chapter in Eau Claire, uh, worked butts off and contributed money to make sure that this became a trout stream and it's a dandy trout stream 20 years later. Um, you know, what else does River, River Falls have the opportunity to do? I'm sh it may be that you've been in a place in a community that has taken out a dam and has created a river walk. One of the best examples I know of a, a comparable river walk is in Baraboo, where four dams were taken out between about 1996 and 2005. The Kiwanis uh, were looking for a project and they, uh, they, they were also too naive to know it couldn't be done. So they, they started raising money and volunteers and partners. And they eventually did a three mile river walk that has uh, historical kiosks and picnic areas and places people get married and benches where you can watch the river any time of the year. And these these rapids where the dams used to be are wonderful paddling. And the fisheries story, they say in Baraboo, well, they, they say in Baraboo, before the dams were taken out, the DNR had identified nine fish species upstream from Baraboo. Now they come up about what 15 miles from the Wisconsin River, but they were beating their head, head heads against the walls, the dams and bearable. Now there are 90 species that have been identified upstream. It there are there are sturgeon and smallmouth bass and walleyes and northerns and and all kinds of stuff. And those impoundments harbored nothing but carp. Uh, so bearable has this fabulous facility, and you're starting to see. Oh, the city hall, the new city hall overlooks the, the freed up river and uh, new co uh, condo development, uh, beautiful condos and the Driftless Glen disp disp Distillery and, and, uh, and restaurant overlook the rapids. Uh, and, and, you know, you couldn't want a better use of that natural system than they're doing in Baraboo. And I don't see any reason that, that we can't help develop that in River Falls. What is this? Oh, so so what do we what can we do to help the Kinney? Uh, there are lots of events. Uh, there's going to be an extensive monitoring program on a river uh, that Kent Johnson and others have set up and they're talking about a pretty unique uh, monitoring program that would take the monitoring data from before the, the dams are out, monitor between the removals and then monitor afterwards. So they can have a longitudinal look at the all kinds of uh, impacts, not just thermal, but turbidity and uh, aquatic species and uh, sedimentation, all those sorts of things. That's a really neat program. Um, there's help is needed to help plan the new Riverside parks and to, to, to speak with the business community about sort of refocusing their attention. Uh, and, and, you know, money, uh, money will help here. Okay, so how much? Um, estimates are that the project costs are about 3.3 .3 million 
and the cities uh, put in agreed to put in 1.2 million for the Powell Falls removal. The DNR grant just came through for a million. We're hopeful that the DNR trout habitat crew will come and do the in-stream habitat work and they'll bring a pile of trout stamp money. Uh, we've already raised, so that's three, uh, 2.2, 2.3. Uh, our fundraising effort has raised another roughly 250,000. So, uh, so we're at about um, 2.5 uh, or a little more. Uh, so we're going to need about six hundred thousand dollars more. Uh, this uh, and and this fundraising effort has had really uh, great response uh, since I quit doing it alone. Uh, we've been lucky enough to have the services of a professional uh, consultant who's been doing this kind of work for forty years, uh, profit and nonprofit, but he's very effective and he's advising our different groups. And then we have different groups that are uh, are raising the money. If you if you take split up that full cost into sort of the the part that the Kinney CC intends to raise, part that the DNR is contributing, part the city's contributing, uh, that breaks down to uh, you know our portion of it is about a million dollars, and uh, we've got teams that are doing that are focusing on foundations, governmental organizations, TU. Uh, individual and family and local local businesses, and then uh, uh, and then other other businesses around the area. Some of those are going great guns. The, the TU goal has been two hundred thousand, and uh, they're at one hundred and forty thousand right now. And they're with with our help, we're going to end up reaching that goal. The foundations are working hard. Gary is a member of that foundations team, and. They have got a lot of stuff that's uh, that they're working on. It's really encouraging. So, you know, it's kind of a kind of a cool opportunity for TU, because if you think about it, chapters and councils and regions uh, don't necessarily very often have the opportunity to step up and do something like this. And it's it's clearly more than one chapter can do. Uh, but what I've seen is that Kayaptawish has been a leader for 30 years on this, a leader throughout the dam removal discussion. And now they're a leader in the, uh, as we're, we're growing close. And a really key ally that's shown up here is Twin Cities TU, which is the second largest chapter in TU with 2000 members. And uh, close to half of their members don't buy a Minnesota uh, trout license. They come over and they fish the Kinney and the rush and some a few of the other streams in western Wisconsin. But they've never been uh, sort of an active supporter of, of the Kinney or, uh, or western Wisconsin. And this time they are. Uh, they, they set a goal immediately. Their board put up 15,000 and asked their members to match it and they already have. And now they're, they're working on, on another effort. And uh, Kayaptawish has set aside $75,000 uh, toward the project and the monitoring over time. Uh, that's already waiting. So there's, you know, this is a nice opportunity uh, for all of us to step up. Um, three of the four Chicago chapters have already contributed. Other chapters around Minnesota have contributed. So TU's been, uh, been fabulous about this. You can see, I, I, I'd like to, Gary's, Gary's one of my, my idols. He, he's been so steady on this thing. And this is a uh, an opportunity in June of 2016, when the National TU Board was meeting in St. Paul, and we happened to have a bus we could rent. We loaded them up. Uh, you know, they they would have sat around and you know wasted time that afternoon. So we brought them over to the Kinney, showed off the Red Cabin project that Kayapta we should done with DNR, and and then brought them to the dams. And Gary talked with them about dam issues, and we got a. Uh, you know, a really nice response. I have to say, um, while TU in the Midwest, TU at the chapter level, or uh, TU at the state level has been supportive of this, there's been a, a marked uh, lack of actual support from the national level. And uh, other than they, they, they helped us with $1,000 to hire that lobbyists that spoke, spoke fluent Republican. Other than that, 
uh, and, and there's one other thing coming up from national that, uh, that, that may help. We'll have to see, but you know, uh, I think, I think national put a lot more into, uh, dam removals on the coast than it does here in flyover land. And I really think if we know anybody at national, we ought to be talking with them about changing that. And so one way, one way to help, or the two, two ways, uh, that you can help to support freeing the kinney is uh, one is donate to match your chapter's donation to the kinney and urge, you know, support of the Friends of Wisconsin to you application. And the other one is to ask your employer to match your donation. Uh, we've had some uh, good responses from employers uh, and that's helped the, the TU effort so far. So don't hesitate to, uh, to, uh, uh, to consider that. Another thing to, that can be done is to donate um, if you're of an age where you have to do a mandatory minimum annual distribution from your IRAs and you really don't need it, you know, to, to buy another fishing kayak, um, you know, you can, you can contribute that or uh, appreciated stock. And you can do either of those through the St. Croix Valley Foundation with whom we are a partner. Uh, the lower right hand picture, uh, the lower the upper left hand picture is just to show you that there are some really nice browns in the lower river and people have been having a great time fishing them. Uh, and the right is uh, former TU National Trustee Sharon Lance from Denver, fishing just below the dam uh, when Min Minneapolis T uh, TCTU hosted the uh, 2006 annual meeting. She had a great time on the water and she, she gave those trout what for as did a number of folks from TU. Um, or, you know, another thing you can do is get to the core of it all. We have um, obtained with permissions, necessary permissions, we've cut some uh, concrete cores from the Powell Falls Dam and they've been made into paperweights. They've got uh, heavy duty industrial felt on the bottom and a plaque on the front that says, Powell Falls Dam RIP, free the kinney. And uh, if any of you are looking for what will become your favorite paperweight, that one is, uh, we'll get one to you in exchange for a $250 donation. So uh, Randy Arnold, the guy from Kayaptowish that can do practically anything, uh, and Gary Horvath, who does everything else, uh, kind of combined on this one, and it's a, it's a darn fine uh, memento. So I'm sure that there'll be a, be a rush for people to, people to get, a, get a hold of those. And one of our volunteers suggested a new motto, taking the Paul Falls Dam out one core at a time. Don't worry, we'll make more. And even, even better, we'll decorate your favorite fishing hat with this Free the Kinney pin. I think that's gonna be what the, what's on every stylish fishing hat in the upper Midwest. So the suggested donations on those are $500. Uh, it's a little exclusivity. So I think they'll be pretty sought after too. One more question about this river is, you know, there's a significant amount of paddler use, particularly through several um, kayak liveries that operate in the lower river and dump trailers full of, uh, of uh, kayaks on the river uh, every summer morning about 8.30. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're one of the things that uh, I'd suggest is if you know anybody who is associated with the kayaking industry in River Falls or that might even have some hooks into them. Uh, why don't you suggest to them that maybe they ought to be having a, a surcharge for their their users per trip that is earmarked uh, for the uh, uh, for the Kinney Dam Removal Project. Uh, this may be our only opportunity to really help out on this. It's needed now uh, from TU and others. Uh, it may not be needed as much on the second dam removal, but you know we share the river. We ought to share the responsibility for trying to uh, take out these dams. So these are the uh, the fundraising campaign uh, partners, uh, the Kinney Corridor, TU, and particularly the and the and the Saint Croix Valley Foundation. We've had a uh, it's been a a good experience so far. And I, I think we're building some interesting things for the future in River Falls. Um, and uh, I just thought, uh, I, I think I, when I was at the, the Marmot Dam in 2001, I watched salmon trying to jump up 
that dam and their noses got probably 15 feet up on the concrete before they fell back into the water. So this was uh, maybe one of them was named Larry. So that's what that's what I have to offer. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Let's look at the chat. Gary. Gary says there's talk of moving the channel to the east at the lower end. The figures vary, but it's felt that the sediment can be sequestered within the impoundment boundaries. Thanks, Gary. Um, and from Gary again, there's a shared website uh, at Twin Cities TU, and uh, and Kent Johnson has a new report that you can access. Uh, this was uh, uh, there were there was good news about cold water uh, on on the river in uh, in 2000, uh, 2021. So thanks, Gary. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing now, and uh, and invite you to fire away with questions. Hey Duke, uh, before folks do that, I just wanted to thank you for coming on board tonight and uh, presenting this to us and, and kind of giving us a um, a great solid background on where this thing started and and where it's possibly headed. Um, I also wanted to, um, as long as we have Gary Horvath on, I, I, I wanted to ask Gary, or maybe take a minute and give Gary a minute to to talk about the the um, the efforts that the local chapter is doing, um, particularly like with regards to like stream monitoring and how your your chapter has has approached, um, you know, assessing the water. And because I think you're doing it the exact right way, you know, using the science and and the data to like drive the decision making process. So could you maybe just take a minute to to explain how your chapter got involved in that and all the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, this back um, in the early 90s, I think when Andy Lamberson was president, I see he's on um, the chapter put five uh, thermistors in the river. And our main goal at that time was uh, we're really concerned with uh, urban development and stormwater impacts. That was our main goal. We wanted to see what effect stormwater was having. So we had sites above town and then through town and at, at um, like five locations. And, you know, we, we worked on, uh, I think Andy and, you know, I and Kent Johnson and a number of people um, were really focused on um, stormwater ordinance that eventually got passed and was one of the, I think it was the best stormwater ordinance in the state of Wisconsin at the time. And, um, and um, you know, but as, as Kent looked at the data, he saw that uh, the dams had a, had a thermal impact. And so we, you know, we just decided to just keep the monitoring going. It's gotten a little bigger and, you know, we monitor in other streams to show, you know, proof of concept that our habitat actually improves water quality, uh, improves invertebrates and temperature. And, um, and they, I, you know, in the back of everyone's mind was, is the, they knew that the license was coming up in 30 years. And as we got closer and closer, um, you know, we waited, we waited for, as I said earlier, I waited around so that I could try to, you know, lead the chapter against the dam and, um, Surprisingly, the whole community kind of rose up and it was a, a great process. And uh, it, it, it was interesting because at the end of the day, I was on the corridor committee that made the recommendation that uh, Duke um, outlined and uh, it was kind of, you know, contentious. It was pretty well split. And we made the recommendation and there was uh, one particular city councilman who has a lot of sway on the council. Um, most, you know, number of council members um, listen to this person and Kent prepared a, a little summary report and it basically showed that, you know, if we don't get rid of these dams, it, possibly within the lifetime of this permit that the river could tip and be drastically impacted below town. And that data was what changed his mind. He he saw that and he said, okay, you guys are right. And he switched his vote and he brought everyone with, and it was unanimous to, 
to pass the resolution that uh, will ultimately make the Kinney run free. And so now the goal is to keep monitoring and show uh, the, the council ask that we be able to demonstrate um, improvements in the water. So we have a citizen-based water monitoring group that Kent's leading. Uh, the Kinney Co Collaborative hired a couple interns and so we're, we're, we're doing that. And um, like I said, I put the link up to the preliminary data. It was only one data point, but um, the cold water inputs from the South Fork and the Springs have definitely benefited the lower river. And even though the river's taken a beating with sediment, um, it uh, is a pretty narrow canyon and one flood will, will clear that once everything's stable. So we're not too worried about that, but uh, so yeah, the monitoring, which started to solve one issue, which it really lent itself to, turned out to be super beneficial. And the other interesting note is it's the longest running data set on a stream in Wisconsin of its kind. And uh, Matt Mitro from the, um, the trout researcher from uh, Southern part of the state took the data and he did some, um, you know, advanced statistics and looked at it. And he was able to document um, um, global warming's impact. So the river is warming ever so slightly, but the river is warming just due to um, climate change. And it's the only set of data that he had that he could show that. So it's an important data set. Uh, it served us well, and we're going to continue to do it as, you know, as long as Kent's around. I don't know if he drops dead. I don't know what we'll do. We'll have to figure out how to keep going. But um, yeah, the monitoring was critical for um, convincing decision makers to, to pull this dam. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I should point out too that TU National and all, to be in all fairness, they did help support some of the monitoring efforts with a, an Embrace the Stream grant that I believe your chapter got. Yeah, that's. That is correct. Recently. And I, I believe there's somebody's putting in another application for Embrace Stream dollars this year. I'm, I'm expecting. Yeah, TCTU, we're working with them and they're going to put in a um, a grant to basically there's a small and one of the springs is impounded. Well, they both are, but the one that is the primary spring is impounded and um, we're going to uh, remove the um, berm along it and reconnect the actual springs to the wetland and um, so that we get full benefit of that and plus create a spawning area and um, fry um, shelter during the winter so yeah uh, so it's a good sounds, it's a good little project within this bigger project that's very yeah that sounds great yeah. yeah I want to give a chance to, to bring Duke back in here with a, a question from our own Tom Lager. Um, Tom asks, is there any funding available to you from the infrastructure bill that, that passed Congress last year? Have you looked into that at all, Duke? Uh, very much so. Um, the, um, the infrastructure bill is being managed by a number of gatekeepers uh, in different parts of the country. And in our part of the country, it's the Fish and Wildlife Service. And the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in terms of rivers is interested in uh, uh, funding projects that will benefit brook trout. And uh, you can't uh, find scientific support for the idea that you're gonna turn the lower river into a, a brook trout uh, refuge, refugia. And, uh, and so that's been uh, a hurdle that we haven't been able to convince the uh, past or present DNR folks uh, to, to, to say it'll be a benefit to Brook Trout. Uh, they won't play it on the come unless, and, and it's, it's frustrating because if they don't have the science, then they won't support it, but you won't have the science until you get the dam out and figure out what's going on. So the next step, Tom, is to go a step higher and and ask people to uh, listen to uh, other things than whether or not it's gonna help brook trout to get the dam out. Uh, it's gonna help the river to get the dam out. And I think it will help brook trout, but you know, I'm just a, a recovering lawyer for cripe's sake. I'm not a biologist and I can't get a biologist to agree with me, you know? So um, we, we think there might be a possibility in the next year to 
make it past that first cut so that we're in a in an area where we don't have to prove benefit to Burke Trout to get infrastructure help. So there's hope that we're going to be able to get past that hurdle uh, next year. And I'll I'll talk with you offline about that at some point. Great, thanks. Yeah, that's frustrating um, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's change subject here a little bit. Charlie had a good question about the sediment that's that's going to be coming downstream or that's that's already there, you know, from some of these flooding events. Like, is there a plan to go in and like scoop that out or are we just naturally letting letting nature like reclaim the banks and, and do what she wants with it? You know, in, in these areas where uh, dams have been in place for a long time and have formed impoundments, uh, the downstream areas are often sediment starved, which means that they don't have uh, the, the the ecosystem based on the presence of sediment, uh, and uh, and in the case of the Elwha dams, there was no, you know, they were there for a hundred years, and there was no bar at the mouth of the of the Elwha dams in the Olympic Peninsula. And since they took out those dams, they let that flush out, and it's created bars. There's a whole uh, river bar uh, ecosystem <clears throat> there. Uh, that that hasn't been there for a hundred years. In the case of the Kinney, we end up with um, we end up with uh, um, this this sediment working its way down into the Saint Croix. And two of the studies that were done in preparation for the FERC relicensing had to do with uh, sediment and turbidity as one one study, and the other with the impact potential impact on the um, mussel beds in the St. Croix, which are a matter of their endangered mussels and rare and, and concerned mussels. Uh, and they really didn't want to uh, adversely affect them. And, the, and, and building into the analysis, what happens with flood sediment, uh, the upshot was uh, the professional, the malacologists and the sediment people said, they're not going to adversely affect the St. Croix and that sediment's going to work its way down. So it's just going to be normal river processes at work. Now, for for now, yeah, there's more sediment in the river because you've, you know, the the original estimate was you were going to have to move 46,000 cubic yards of sediment, and we've had 23,000 according to the estimates that have already moved. So, uh, you know, how much more is going to come if you sculpt back the sediment that's in the impoundment, bring it out to the edge of the impoundment, or move some of it off site a quarter mile to an unused quarry. You know, you're not gonna have that going downstream. So eventually it's gonna flush out. And dredging, uh, dredging that river would be just an incredible set of headaches. You know, you got 350 foot bluffs on both sides for the next seven miles. Uh, that's gonna be a really long hose. We, we don't have that much money, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it sounds like Tom Lager is, is definitely interested in, in uh, continuing conversation with you. So make sure that you two get in touch with each other. Um, I know Tom's been heading up a big um, dam removal project in the, in, in the Watoma area in the Central Sands. So mm -hmm. um, he's dealing with a lot of the same issues that you folks are dealing with too. Um, it is nine o'clock, 9.01. Um, I think we'll We'll maybe uh, give an opportunity to wrap this up before we go. I kind of wanted to ask you, um, we didn't really talk about the fishing a whole lot. If you piqued somebody's interest and they're going to come over and spend a day on the Kinney, like, can you maybe let us know what to expect? Like what, just, well, just kind of walk us through what a day of fishing on the Kinney might look like. Well, now that Gary's, Gary's muted, this is perfect opportunity for me to say, um, uh, Lund's Fly Shop is a really good, fly shop and the twin cities fly shops are keyed in on the on the kinney as well that we're on uh, kinney's on their dry erase boards um uh but uh you know the both both kayak to wish and twin cities to you have have been really hospitable to people who have come from chapters that have supported this project and they're glad to take people out on the river all you have to do is check in with gary stay muted gary and uh and <laughs> 
and he'll be glad to erase some hosted time on the water. Uh, and you know, I, I I've fished the Kinney since what 1988, I guess, off and on. Not as much as uh, most of the Kayaptowish people or any other Twin Cities people. Uh, but I gotta say, there are so many spectacularly wonderful, serene, high quality fishing places on that river that uh, I can't. Uh, there, I it's it's hard to find a stream that has such consistent quality in the fishing as as a Kinney does, and uh, and hatches are great. And uh, I did spend a good chunk of one one season trying to find hexes on the Kinney because I I knew they were there somewhere. Uh, but you know how hex fishermen are; they won't tell you where they are. And I after night after night after night of waiting. I, I heard one fly over because they make that little click, 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 click sound as they fly over. Uh, but I, I never saw one on the water. I not, never caught a fish on one. And I I, I, I might have been dreaming, but Gary would be glad to set you up. Right, Gary? Yeah, we could get someone who knows what they're doing out there and get you where you need to be. The lower river is a classic driftless type stream and the upper river is very different, a slower Spring Creek, a lot of hatches, um, a lot of public access. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like there's something for everyone. I love it. So, it, well, it is. and and you know the fact that it's in a in an urban area or an urbanized area, I suppose, uh, it, it adds something to it that you don't find uh, in very many other places. You know, I can think of. Boise has a Boise River flowing through it, and that's a good fishery. And uh, you know, there are other places. Reno has a Truckee, and you know, there there are a few places that do. But this is a really rare opportunity for a city to uh, to turn its focus to the river. And uh, uh, you know, if you go back to the 1960s, uh, uh, River Falls was still dumping its raw sewage in McKinney, and it was fishermen who were upset and repulsed by that. That finally got the city to change its uh, change its practices. Uh, you know now you have now you have uh, you know Gary's group has done a, a fabulous job here because I think that people often think of trout anglers as kind of eccentrics, uh, solitary types, spend their time you know in frozen cold water up above their gonads and their brains brains are a little addled and and if it was only to you and trout fishermen that were doing this um you don't have a broad enough voice in the watershed and gary and and the folks in river falls broadened that discussion out to include a lot of other people who were concerned about the river now he's gonna he's gonna go into the uh the the bashful situation and and say oh gee it wasn't that much but it, I've, I've watched this for a long time and they did a marvelous job in that community to bring a lot of voices to the discussion yeah and that's certainly something that we found when we were advocating at the state capitol that was the story that we were telling like we wanted to go to this place and we want to fish it and when we're done fishing we want to walk over to the river walk and like sit down on the outdoor patio with the bar or restaurant and have a drink and have a burger and tell fishing stories and like that's that's our idyllic day in river falls <laughs> yep. and uh and i think you know when we start explaining that to people like then the light bulbs you know the light bulbs started going off in their heads like this is this is an economic um this could be an economic engine you know there's an opportunity here to to really do something good for the city and and for the environment which uh you know those two don't always go hand in hand every time so but this is kind of a win-win so um we're going to certainly do what we can to to get get you over the finish line and um you know we'll be in touch and i i'm sure there's going to be you know we'll, we'll continue to talk about this project as it as it evolves you'll see articles and with Stroud in the newspaper and um we can certainly do stuff online and um you know, promote it and keep people updated as, as the project progresses, but really great stuff. And uh, I feel like we're on the verge of like something really good happening here. So just gonna try not to get too excited. We'll keep our heads down and just keep moving forward. And um, one day at a time, we'll get there. Yep, well, and, and this one's an example that can show the city 
uh, that people that care about this river are willing to stand up for it. And, and I think it's going to make it easier in the, in the case of the second dam uh, to, to, to get that, the city behind it. Absolutely. So, and it's really nice to see Kayaptowish TU leading the way and, and TU doing such a good job with it. I, I'm inspired. Yeah, there are very few times in our careers in TU and our, our careers with our chapters and our councils that we get to see this opportunity. And yeah. they're stepping up for it. Yep. Absolutely. <clears throat> so with that, I will say cheers. I uh, hope to see some of you out at the state council meeting in the Driftless uh, this coming weekend. And, um, and we will talk to you again soon. So thanks again, Duke and Gary, for coming on and sharing. Thank you. It's been a treat. Appreciate it. Have a good night. You're good.